Good morning. This is Faith in Our Hometown, brought to you as a community service and sponsored by Mercy Hospital Joplin. And now, here is your host, Father Jay Friedel. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Sunday morning on Faith in Our Hometown. I can hardly believe that September is almost gone. It just amazes me how time flies. But we're here on another Sunday morning to talk about things that matter to us as people of faith in the greater Joplin area. This morning, we're going to be talking a little bit about a political hot potato, if you will, because uh, some people are of the firm belief that Medicaid should be expanded, and other people are saying, oh, no, that would be the end of life as we know it. Uh, in the state of Missouri. So we're going to be here to talk about that a little bit, the pros and the cons, uh, and uh, to hear a little bit about that from K.J. McDonald, who's the Southwest Missouri Organizer for Missouri Healthcare for All. And so we are going to be talking to you specifically about Medicare expansion, and we'll get her opinion on that. And of course, that'll either help you to agree or disagree or figure out where you want to go from there. We are going to talk about Medicaid expansion with K.J. McDonald right after this Mercy Minute. So grab your cup of coffee, settle in, and stay with us. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths in the U.S., and now we have an effective tool to screen for it. A low-dose CT uses a lower amount of radiation than a standard chest CT. Breathe in. Better detailed pictures than a chest x-ray of small abnormal areas of the lung. A person must be between 55 to 77 years old, asymptomatic, which means they don't have any symptoms such as coughing up blood, chronic cough, shortness of breath, unusual weight loss, or any other worrisome symptoms. They must also be a current smoker or have quit with in the past 15 years, also must have a 30 pack year history or more, which equates to smoking one pack a day for 30 years or two packs a day for 15 years. People generally avoid these scans possibly due to fear of what could be found. Like many other cancers, if we can detect lung cancer early, it could be very treatable and life-saving. Well, again, thanks for joining us for another Sunday morning here at Faith in Our Hometown. Uh, My guest, KJ McDonald of Missouri Healthcare for All. KJ, thanks for coming back and joining us again. I know you were with us in the fall for a different show. Yeah. Uh, But I do want it. I've been wanting to talk about this issue of Medicaid and whether or not it's a good reason to expand or not. And you find people on both sides of the issue arguing their case. And I'll let you argue your case in a second. But before we do that, let's set it up for everybody. Why is this an issue? What is Medicaid? Again, for anybody that might not understand, let's set up the issue and say, what are the pros and the cons? What are people arguing about why this is a good idea or not a good idea? And then we'll get to what you think. Yeah, absolutely. So Medicaid is a federal and state funded program that provides health care services for um, low income parents and families, children, seniors and people with disabilities. So it's essentially set up as part of our safety net programs Mm -hmm. to help people gain access to their to health care and to be treated for their health care needs in a system where a lot of people really can't afford health care. Right. Okay. So that's why we have Medicare. Medicaid. Medicaid. Uh huh. See, this is what I start talking about (laughs) and I start mixing the two up. So that's opposed to Medicare. Yep. Medicare is typically for senior citizens, people who are 65 and above, um, and it, it they, you know they're kind of similar, but they are run very differently. Right, they're run very differently mm-hmm. because the one is for you know more people who've out you know who've kind of aged out of a different part of a system. Yep. And the other one is for people who can't afford it otherwise. Absolutely. Okay. So we're going to talk about to this morning about those folks that couldn't afford it otherwise. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's the goal of what we're talking about Medicaid. So why why are people so afraid of us expanding this? And so what's the issue at stake? Right? Right now. So I think that whenever it comes to Medicaid, you don't really find a ton of opponents for it um, in the health insurance industry, in the hospital industry. Um, a lot of the barriers come from an ideological standpoint. And I think that that's um, a lot of distrust of the government own, um, kind of running our programs, mm-hmm. running health care. Sure. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with people feeling like it's an entitlement and that people may not be doing their fair share who receive these services. Um, and then, of course, there's always the argument of cost which is, you know, will it cost us too much as a state with a balanced budget? Will we be able to afford to provide for all of these people? So those are the main arguments that I hear whenever we're talking about uh, Medicaid and Medicaid expansion. Yeah. So uh, we have chosen in Missouri not to expand on many issues uh, in this regard. Um, and again, uh, sometimes I hear the argument because uh, they want to be fiscally responsible. Right. That's a big, I mean, that's just a big thing for our legislators. And, and I'm, you know, and I got to respect them for, you know, trying to make sure 
we got balanced budgets and all those kinds of things. Absolutely. I can understand that. But um, but but in your opinion, is is you, you know, is that the right thing to do? Yeah. And so why or why not? So you know, it's incredibly hard. A lot of people don't um, actually realize how hard it is to qualify for Medicaid um, as an able-bodied person in Missouri. So actually, you have to make less than 22% of the federal poverty level to be able to qualify as a parent. And if you're a low-income adult with no children, you absolutely can't qualify no matter how poor you are. So, and, you know, we know that our healthcare system is extremely um, expensive. Sure. There are high profits for um, hospitals, in, uh, insurance companies, and for pharmaceuticals. And so a lot of that cost um, and the, the uh, burden of that has fallen back on the taxpayers and on um, the consumers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that expansion would enable us to kind of open up the eligibility for a lot of folks who are in between being a little bit too rich, <laughs> to, so to speak, for Medicaid and being able to actually afford private insurance. Um, and we have half a million people in Missouri who are uninsured. And we have kind of looked at the numbers of folks who would be able to qualify if we did expand, and that would probably cut that number in half. So I think that this um, has always been a very good option for us. We're one of only 14 states that have yet to expand Medicaid. And we did have the option to get 100% of that funding covered by the federal government up until 2016. Now that we've passed that threshold, it's 90%, but that's um, you know continuously. So from here on out, if we were to expand Medicaid in Missouri, 90% would be covered by the federal government. So a lot of people are concerned with the cost, but we do see that that would be shifting some programs that are not currently federally funded in the state of Missouri into the umbrella of having 90% of that covered by the federal government. So there's a chance that we actually might come out ahead as a state um, if we were to expand Medicaid. Not to mention the fact that people wouldn't be depending on emergency rooms as their main source of health care, and they would be able to go to preventative um, health care checkups, have their mental health issues addressed, and hopefully hold down jobs and be more productive members of society. Yeah, and I just want to, uh, since Mercy does uh you know, sponsor us and mm -hmm. everything. Uh, I have not, I have not spoken to a, a person at Mercy about this, and I, I just want to make sure our viewers know that they trust me to just bring up issues and talk about them, and they don't try to edit me or to do any of those kinds of things. <laughs> and I really love them for that because uh, I hate to be micromanaged. Yeah. But, um, but at any rate, um, I, you know, I don't know what the what you know a lot of the hospitals. I do know that there are a lot of uh, costs by you know by Mercy and Freeman that are eaten up by you know uh, f folks who are unable to pay. Yeah. Uh, you know in some ways it, it might be helpful to help some of those you know help those budgets you know kind of to take a little relief off but again what would it do for um, you know I guess you say it wouldn't affect necessarily our immediate taxes as a state but will it, would it have an impact on our taxes that we pay to the federal government so nothing would increase as far as taxes go actually the taxes that go into the Medicaid expansion program are already going from us to the federal government. So really what's happening is there's been money going out of Missourians' pockets, but not coming back in through Medicaid expansion. So we would actually be just be taking fun funding that already exists in the federal government. And it's funny you mentioned hospitals. There are actually, most hospitals are very supportive of Medicaid mm -hmm. expansion, um, because as you mentioned, they do often have to treat people who are uninsured. Of course, if somebody comes in and they're yeah. sick, they have to be treated. Yeah, if they're having um, a crisis, we don't, you know, we don't say do you have money first before we treat anybody. Absolutely not. And so, and oftentimes that cost does fall back onto the hospitals and they have to foot it. Um, and ultimately that affects also the taxpayers and the premiums that we pay in the larger marketplace. So really we're all paying for people to be uninsured. Um, so it really just makes sense all around. You know, we've had, I think five or six hospitals close since 2010 in Missouri. Most of them have been in rural parts of the state. And if the people in those areas had access to Medicaid and um, had a healthcare or insurance plan that enabled to utilize those hospitals, there's a chance that they might not have closed down. So I think that we see a lot of benefits across the, the spectrum, you know, from healthcare to economical to obviously the personal benefit of being healthier and more productive people. Yeah. Now, there's going to be people who are listening right now uh, who are going to say, this is just too easy. You're making it seem like such a no-brainer, <laughs> you know? Yeah. What, 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 what would your opponents say uh, to, you know, to argue with you? And what, what, what do you hear? Uh, and what are some of the big questions that you get from people who are really opposed to this? So I think a lot of people are concerned about um, people getting access to Medicaid who aren't working. 
Um, and you know they're concerned that if they're not putting into the system, then they shouldn't be benefit benefiting from it. And I totally understand that concern. Of course, we want everybody to be a productive member of society and to sure. be working. And you know most people do too. They want to be able to provide for their families. Um, what we do see, just to kind of respond to that really fast, is that. 60% of the adults on Medicaid who are able-bodied in Missouri are working. So most people who are already on Medicaid, despite the fact that they have very low incomes to be able to qualify for the program, are still working, whether it's you know part-time or they have a couple jobs here and there. So give me an idea of, so you, you mentioned the poverty, you know, with the percentage of mm -hmm. the poverty level or what. So let's make this a little bit more concrete Absolutely. for everybody. Yeah. You know, in terms of, so what, how much money would a person be making uh, if they were going to qualify for right. Medicaid? So currently, as I said, the federal poverty level that you have to qualify for is pretty low, 22%. So that means that a family of three, the parents can't take in more than about 370 a month and qualify for Medicaid themselves. Like $370. Um, $370 a month for a family of three. Um, that's about f a little bit more than $4,000 a year for the parents mm -hmm. to qualify. So you see the population of, of um, adults, of parents who are able-bodied and, and on Medicaid in Missouri is extremely low. It's very, yeah. very small because who's living off three seventy dollars a month for a family of three? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's extremely hard to qualify as it is. If we were to expand, we would open up eligibility to 138% of the federal poverty level which means that those families of three could be making about 2,300 a month and be able to qualify for Medicaid. So think of all the people in between who are working low income jobs um, in the fast food service industry, retail, who can't get access to insurance through their jobs. Those people would be able to get Medicaid coverage. Yeah. And again, this would might be in some ways uh, in, you know, in lieu of some of the other people that don't really want to uh, you know, do, you know, Obamacare and some of those other things, this in some ways would be providing at least for folks who, again, who uh, still $28,000 a year isn't a lot for a family of three. I mean, that's not a whole lot of money. No. And so uh, in terms of doing some of that, that would open that up. And, and this would in some ways save, uh, you know, or at least make this uh, medical care more possible and affordable for uh, another quarter of a million people in the state of Missouri. Exactly, yeah, we're talking about our working poor and our lower um, to middle class uh, working parents. And also, you know, college students, people who are making around 16,000 a year for a single person, that would open up qualifications to those kind of, you know, younger people who are kind of just getting into their second, third jobs where they're not making too much a year. Yeah. So uh, how many people do you think that would affect here in our area? So like in our in our viewing area? So I don't have a number on that, but I have looked at a map that kind of has um, darker colors for the regions of the state that would benefit the most from Medicaid expansion and Southwest Missouri and South um, middle to Southeast Missouri are the darkest blue on the map. Well, we're also, I mean, you know, I just know because our, our uh, diocese is the southern third of the state of Missouri. And we've got most of the poorest mm -hmm. counties in yeah. the state of Missouri. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them here in the southern third of the state of Missouri. Right. So that, that in so many ways would also, uh, you know, kind of alleviate some of that for people right here in our hometown and our, in our larger uh, viewing area. Yeah, we would feel the, a direct impact in our community. Um, and think of all of the people who you know who are uninsured, who can't go to the doctor whenever something pops up, um, or who are going into medical debt whenever they have to go to the hospital to treat something traumatic. What would that mean for those people if they weren't facing a lifetime of debt? and instead knew and had the peace of mind that whenever something happens, they could go to the hospital and get it taken care of. Yeah. My guest this morning, KJ McDonald uh, from Missouri Healthcare for All. We're talking about the possibility of advocating for Medicaid expansion, if you're liking what you're hearing. Uh, but uh, we're gonna be right back uh, after a quick break. So don't go away, uh, we'll be right back to talk a little bit more. You're watching Faith in Our Hometown on KSN TV. Brought to you as a community service and sponsored by Mercy Hospital Joplin. So again, thanks for sticking with us here on another Sunday morning about a topic that is not real popular, uh, but maybe that we need to be talking about a little bit more. Um, I'm always kind of fascinated. Uh, we were talking right before the break a little bit about uh, people who might, uh, you know, right now making very little, $370 a month are the only ones below that that would be uh, 
would be eligible. Mm -hmm. If we raised and expanded, uh, we would catch a whole lot more people yeah. under that, up to the to the tune of about twenty eight thousand dollars a year. You'd said, yeah. Um, and then we also talked about this business about you know the folks that are uninsured uh, and uh, sometimes who won't get medical care until they're on death's door because they can't afford the coverage, they can't afford to be insured. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that. How might this help that situation? Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about Medicaid and Medicaid expansion, we often refer to what we call the Medicaid gap, um, which refers to these people who make just too much to qualify for Medicaid and don't make enough to qualify for subsidies for healthcare plans on the marketplace. Um, and even to go a little bit further, people who might qualify for subsidies but still can't afford those premiums. Um, so there are all of these people in this gap who don't really have access to affordable insurance. And you know, therefore, they do end up putting off medical problems until they've gotten so bad that they need to go in for emergency care. And then, you know, of course, the cost just exponentially goes up from well, there. Well, sure, because they're already really sick as yeah. opposed to something that might have been treatable a little bit earlier. Right. So, um, you know, as I said, there are about half a million folks in Missouri who are uninsured. And we um, kind of guesstimate that there are, are around somewhere from 100 to 200,000 of those who are in this Medicaid gap um, who would be covered by Medicaid if we were to expand it to 138% of the federal poverty level. Um, so these folks... Now is that our only option to go from what we got now to 138%? Is that really our only... So it's, it is if we want to secure that federal funding right okay. off the bat. Okay, all right. Um, there so that's are, key. That's what triggers some of that. Yes. Okay, all right. Um, but there are some states that have attempted to apply for waivers to kind of change up those eligibility requirements, maybe to only go 100% of the federal poverty level or to acquire um, working requirements for people to qualify for Medicaid. And we haven't seen a ton of success in those getting approved. Um, and we also kind of think that 138% of the federal poverty level is actually still pretty low. As you mentioned, about 28,000 a year for a family of three um, is 138%. And so I don't really see the benefit in us going lower than that. You know, in fact, I would advocate for going much higher, but it's set up the way that it is. Um, but, you know, and we also don't want there to be too many barriers between people and their health care. When you start adding all of those requirements in there, you're adding red tape, you're adding more fil files that need to be filled out, more things that need to be sent to the um, Department of S Social Services, and that you need to cross your fingers and hope don't get mixed up and lost, um, which is actually an issue that we've been keeping an eye on in the last year and a half. Um, our Medicaid system did switch to a new verification system and a bunch of people ended up getting dropped from the enrollments um, who actually still qualified for Medicaid. So there was this glitch that happened where their incomes weren't getting verified, their addresses were getting lost and mixed up, and now we're at about over 120,000 folks who still qualify for Medicaid but are being erroneously dropped from the rolls. So we really don't want to add more barriers in there whenever really we could just simplify it and open it up completely. Yeah. And again, for folks who are worried about these kinds of things, this is not going to necessarily affect our state coffers no. by doing this. Mm -mm. Actually, there was a WashU study that showed, um, you know, there, like I said, there are a lot of people who are concerned that this is going to cost Missouri more money. We are covering more people. That is a logical um, argument to follow. But it, it is showing, um, this WashU study showed that we actually could save um, a whole bunch of money as a state by opening up expansion, taking in some more federal funding, and then allowing our population to be healthier and to um, kind of cut back those emergency room costs that we're seeing a lot of people use. So what do our state leaders say, the ones that are still fighting against the expansion? What, is their, what are their biggest arguments? The biggest argument I hear is cost. I think that they think that those estimates are a little bit unreliable. Um, it is, of course, hard to know how many folks are going to actually end up enrolling, right. how expensive will be the needs of those folks. Um, you know, it's, you're, it's kind of a, a roll of the dice whenever it comes to that. So I think that's the number one argument that I hear is that they're, we're afraid that we end up getting ahead of ourselves a little bit as far as cost goes. What about some of the other states that have expanded? What have they, have any of them really, uh, had you know difficulties? Has it has it cost any of them a lot? I think there have been some states who have seen a bunch of savings, and some states states that have seen um, you know a little bit of cost. So there's kind of a whole spectrum for us to look at, and I think that it's really um, you know it is unique state to state. Um, I think that states that tr attempted to put 
work requirements in place saw more problems. We saw that with Arkansas last year where they were having a lot of people who were having a hard time um, getting their eligibility fulfilled for Medicaid because of this requirement and reporting system that that had been put in place. So, you know, I think we're seeing that with a lot of the states who just go ahead and expand it and open it up as is, um, they're seeing less problems that they have to mitigate in the Medicaid program. So you're saying that Arkansas wound up spending a little bit more because they put these requirements on folks to do some of those things. Yep, what happened was um, not only were the requirements just hard, the reporting for it was really hard, people couldn't quite grasp the reporting requirements, but they ended up spending more money on trying to fix the issue and um, you know paying personnel to run the Medicaid system to kind of mitigate those issues. So um, you know I think that's something that we should be wary of and try to avoid. Sure. Um, but at the same time, I mean, you know, everybody does want to make sure that, that again, folks are accountable and Absolutely. trying to figure out how to, you know, do some of that, but, but, but do it in a way that's going to help more rather than hurt more. Absolutely. Yeah. Is the juice worth the squeeze is the saying that we kind of toss around when we're talking about that. You're squeezing them for, for work requirements. How much juice are you going to get out of that? Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So what, how do you respond when people say, well, you're just like a left-wing liberal, you know, give away the farm kind of thing. How do you respond when somebody says something like that? Because, so, I mean, you are, I mean, you're, you're kind of, you know, you're, you, I mean, you're, you're just right in here saying, let's just go for it and do it. Personally, I'm, I'm pretty progressive, <laughs> but the organization that I work for is actually nonpartisan. We work across the aisle. All, all of the legislation that we've worked to pass in the last couple of years has been sponsored by Republicans. Um, we take a lot of pride in fostering our relationships with legislators on both sides of the aisle and there have been largely red states that have passed Medicaid expansion with success. So I don't think that healthcare is a left or right issue. I think that it's a human issue. Um, I think that all of us can't avoid getting sick because we've got these bodies that tend to get sick sometimes. Yeah. So I don't think that it's an issue that should be as politicized as it is. And I really hope that we can get to a point where we're talking about this from a more humanist perspective, um, seeing that there are people who are really struggling and going into debt um, for the sake of some large profits that are going somewhere else, but not to us, the working class people. Yeah. Interesting in terms of uh, of the fact that you know so many of those things have been bipartisan. Absolutely, and you've worked very successfully with some of our Republican lawmakers. I yeah. think that that's a good thing. So, give us some stories about what what this might affect, or give us some of the stories about some of the people that you know who got severely hampered. Because I, I just know that stories are what really catch our our viewers attention a little bit more because yeah. when they hear a story or they can put a you know a, you know kind of like a if you will a face with the name even though we're not going to do that obviously but when they can do that it, it sometimes gives people a, 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 an easier way to grab hold of the issue absolutely so I'll tell you a little about a friend that I know um, who had some reproductive system issues and they were unable they were uninsured and they were definitely in the Medicaid gap making less than six, 17 sixteen thousand dollars a year as a single person and no children, so they could not have qualified for Medicaid um, no matter how hard they tried. And uh, they ended up doing a GoFundMe to try to raise enough money for the surgery that they had to have that you know, was life-saving. And I think they only ended up raising about four or $5,000 and ended up with about twelve dollars or $14,000 worth of medical bills. Um, now, if this person had been able to be on Medicaid, they would not have seen any of those bills. And I know that the stress that they suffered purely because of the cost of that um, had them so that they were unable to go to work because they were so stressed out. They were prolonging their suffering because they were, they were having to save up money and continually put off the surgery in order to get in there. So I, have to, I think we have to think about who are all of the people in our lives that are uninsured who are just kind of putting off those healthcare issues, whether it's you know a, a really weird ear infection or this kind of twinge that you're feeling in your shoulder, maybe you've pulled something. If you don't have healthcare, you can't go in and fix that problem. So like you said, you're waiting until you get to death's door um, and then the cost just goes ex exponentially. And not only the cost, but their quality of life has decreased because they've had to endure the suffering when really as a society that's as rich as we are, as advanced as we are, we should be able to treat people whenever they're sick. Yeah. Yeah, so we are talking with KJ McDonald uh, about uh, the possible possibility of expanding as a state uh, Medicaid uh, and, and making uh, that health care more available to another 250,000 people in the state of Missouri, you know? Yeah. Um, in terms of doing that uh, and in terms of uh, some of the people that you've dealt with, um, is there any reason why we should be afraid of this? 
Not that I'm aware <laughs> of. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, you know, I think, like I said, the cost is, is probably going to be the number one issue. And I think that's all going to just kind of be dependent on how many people end up enrolling and how our systems operate moving forward with our newly expanded system. So I don't see any reason to be afraid of it. I think that we should look to the states that have passed it before us right. and um, see the benefits that they've seen. The opioid crisis has um, been mitigated in a lot of those states. People are able to actually go in for substance abuse um, treatment whenever they need it and actually get prolonged treatment through Medicaid. Um, it's also worked to increase racial equity and diversity um, and inclusion in a lot of our in a lot of urban places where there are a lot of um, low income and um, people of color communities that don't have access to health care and they would be swooped up by Medicaid expansion. So it actually is increasing the health outcomes in those communities and in rural communities. So I think it's kind of the great equalizer when we look at the people who are suffering in our state. Yeah. Well, again, my guest this morning, uh, KJ McDonald from Missouri Healthcare for All. Um, you know, I am going to say this in terms of uh, if somebody wants to come on from the other side and make an argument, um, I'm willing to listen to it because, again, part of what we want to do here on our show is to listen to, you know, sometimes opposing viewpoints about something. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to be real honest here and say that I'm probably in favor of the expansion myself from what I've read and what I've studied. But again, I may not know it all. So we're going to be right back after this Mercy Minute. Don't go away. Stick with us. The whole purpose of screening uh, is to catch people who have a significant smoking history early enough where we can do something about it and potentially improve the duration of life. The minimum recommendation for screening is 30 pack years. So usually people who've smoked more than 30 pack years are the ones that we're screening. If we start screening yearly with low dose CT scans, we can reduce the risk of death from lung cancer by 20 to 25%. Stage one, two, and three cancers potentially can be cured. When it becomes stage four, the possibility of cure falls significantly. Well, again, thanks for joining us for another Sunday morning here at Faith in Our Hometown. Uh, you know, sometimes when I originally uh, conceived of this show, we were going to try to do more uh, debate between people, but we're not always really set up for it. And, uh, you know, sometimes it, winds, you know, it gets difficult. But one of the things we wanted to model for everybody is that we can have differing opinions on some topics, but we still should be able to speak about them. We should still be able to debate them without getting, uh, you know, acrimonious or nasty toward each other. Uh, even if we happen to take a different viewpoint on something. So again, if somebody's got different opinions, please let me know. Please give us an opportunity to maybe interview somebody else who might have some differing opinions. One of our lawmakers, one of our folks who oppose this, uh, just give me a ring or a call and let's, let's maybe look at a different side. But uh, this is uh, our discussion today and I thank KJ McDonald from uh, Missouri Healthcare for All for coming on and talking about the possibility of Medicaid expansion. I hope your Sunday is fabulous and I hope you are blessed this day. Come back and join us the next week for Faith in Our Hometown. Thanks for watching. Faith in Our Hometown can be seen Sunday mornings at 6.30 and 9 a.m. on KSN. Brought to you as a community service and sponsored by Mercy Hospital Joplin.